This conference will now be recorded. So good evening, Mark, and I welcome all of you on behalf of Nature Classrooms, my regional museum of natural history, Bhubaneswar, and we are here uh, back on a Sunday evening with a very interesting topic, which is usually uh, considered to be very difficult because of the diversity. And actually, also, if you look at arthropods and their diversity in the animal kingdom. Probably they make 70% of all animals in the world on this planet. Isn't that huge? So, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very, very uh, keen and sincere uh, enthusiast with us today. And like I tell you, the Nature Classroom is dedicated to passion, to uh, the, the determination with which we feel conservation must be taken ahead. And therefore, we do not see ourselves to only the top notch scientists available in the country. Today we have Anubhav Agarwal, who is a diehard fan of these curious critters he's going to talk to us about. Hello Anubhav, can we have you, oh, uh, you appear on your camera? And Anubhav has been looking at these uh, animals since he was quite young. We had a chance a meeting at one of those meets when we discussed arachnology and look what fate has. Today we have Anubhav speaking to all of you about his lifelong passion of following insects and other creatures, which uh, actually enthuse him to a great extent. So let us listen to his stories about these little creatures around us who really cast a spell upon other animals and really take control of other animals in very invisible ways. Though very little and uh, invisible many times, these insects can truly compose a very important part of the ecosystem and also the whole planet as such. So if there is any particular taxa which actually rules the animal kingdom, it is arthropoda. So let us listen to a talk with, where he will be describing about two very important uh, characters of insects, which is uh, camouflage and mimicry. So uh, the stage is all yours, Anubha. We will be uh, uh, we will be really interested if you can introduce yourself a little better to all of us. Because the Chennai guy who has tracked these insects in such a long time will be really nice to listen to your stories. The stage is all yours, and nature, well, and nature Classrooms welcomes you uh, with a hearty uh, welcome. Thank you so much for your consent and having uh, consented to speak to our audience. Thank you very much, Devi. Um, <clears throat> thanks for uh, the uh, letting me have this opportunity and for your introduction of me and of this session and uh, welcome everyone good evening and uh, like devi said i'm here to talk about um, insects and their uh, ability for camouflage and mimicry uh, which they have evolved over millions of years and uh, sorry just, uh, I, I will be taking care of the ones, uh, those who are serving. I request the audience to please put themselves on mute, uh, without which it will be really difficult for the presenter to go ahead with the presentation. As far as my voice is concerned, maybe it's a bit unclear today, but that's, that's fine. We need to listen to Anubhav. So, so, um, so well, um, yes, welcome everyone. and. Uh, Oddly, uh, I have to say that I hope you cannot read what I've written on the screen because that is exactly the topic of our uh, talk today, uh, which is basically things that are in front of our eyes, but we cannot see them, which is uh, hiding in plain sight or pretending to be something else. And uh, for various reasons, various creatures have evolved these traits for various, um, you know, to serve various purposes of theirs. So we'll get on with it and um, yeah. 
so we'll start with camouflage now what is camouflage in case uh, you don't already know it basically means hiding in plain sight and as you can see over here uh, it also means that uh, creatures that blend into the background in order to not be seen and uh, these traits have developed uh, for various features for various reasons as i said and uh, what happens is most of the time uh, creatures uh, develop these sort of abilities in order for their own protection and self-defense by the way in case you didn't notice there's a huge uh, garden lizard here on the branch uh, just to give you a sense of uh, what it's about and uh, Alternatively, other than for their own protection and uh, to protect themselves from becoming prey, uh, it's also for predators like this garden lizard. Um, it's important for them to not be seen because to be seen by their prey means, uh, you know, the prey is going to fly away or run away before it can get to them and thereby it would lose a meal of its own. So. For various reasons, we'll see uh, case to case. Uh, we'll see many examples. We'll see many types of camouflage and mimicry and so on. Uh, and it's fairly common in the animal kingdom to uh, see this uh, sort of camouflage from large animals like tigers and uh, leopards to the smallest creatures like insects and spiders. So we'll have a look, of course, not at uh, big mammals for now but uh, we'll stick to insects mostly and um, yeah. start off i've uh, chosen something fairly common it's uh, what is called the common barren butterfly and uh, the common barren butterfly caterpillar please mute yourself um, with the one, so I... kindly mute yourself. So Subharanjan Das, kindly mute yourself. Okay, anyway, I'll get on with the show. So this is the caterpillar of the common barren butterfly, as I was saying, and uh, this is a fairly common butterfly and its distribution ranges in pretty much all of India. And uh, also the larval host plant of this uh, caterpillar, one of the larval host plants is mango, which is also fairly well distributed all over the country. Uh, by country, of course, I'm referring to India. I'm assuming that most of the participants here are from India as well. So nevertheless, now, as you can see, uh, it places itself directly at the center of the leaf, uh, at the central vein, and its body itself has this yellow line, which it aligns with the vein of the leaf. And once it does, it gets pretty well camouflaged in plain sight. And, uh, you know, also the thing is, uh, plants like mango, they grow into large trees. And so uh, one might even find them on the higher reaches of the uh, canopy but nevertheless i've seen these guys on a much uh, on lower branches and lower hanging leaves and they can be quite incredible out in the field to find uh, like this another example of a moth is on the sand just now this guy is uh, you know very easily effortlessly uh, becoming invisible to most that pass by. In fact, I almost stepped on it, and if, and if I hadn't noticed it move a bit, I probably would not have noticed it at all. And despite, if you look at uh, the moth closely, the uh, top half and the bottom half itself seem so different from each other in terms of coloration and pattern. But overall, when it's on the right sort of substrate, and uh, you know, again, uh, through evolution and uh, through millions of years of uh, developing these traits, they have hardwired within themselves. <laughs> A very strong sense of what substrates uh, provides them this sort of a camouflage cover and what substrates don't. Uh, we'll see uh, some more examples of such things uh, further in the presentation. And um, this is a typical scene of leaf litter on the ground. You can see uh, some mud, some grass, and some dry leaves on the ground. 
and of course you might have seen the grasshopper on it as well uh, here's a closer look at it and uh, so before we go further uh, i'd like to make another point here is that when we try to take uh, pictures of these uh, creatures especially if these are smaller critters like insects and spiders it could be from our mobile phones it could be from a fancy dslr with the you know like a flash and diffuser and so on either ways the point being that it takes some amount of effort to focus the camera to get the lighting right and thus the creature emerges fairly clearly for all to see but out in nature it's not that easy like if you're going around in the field or in the garden looking for these guys or even if you're not looking for these guys they might not be so easy to find i'll just like to make an example of what i'm trying to get at so this is uh, a spot on a mango tree trunk and this is a very casual picture with not much focus and lighting and the exact same spot of the exact same tree a second later i took with the proper focus and lighting and this is what comes out of it literally not comes out of it but this was what was there all along so this gives you a sense of how a picture can uh, you know not do justice to the amazing ability of camouflage that creatures like this can display anyhow so we'll go on and see another example and this little guy uh in case you haven't spotted it there is one little bug over here and this little guy is uh, a nymph a juvenile of uh, what are called assassin bugs now assassin bugs are a kind of true bug and uh, the entire family of assassin bugs as the name suggests are basically predatory bugs and when in their nymph stage even though they are predators most creatures when they are in their juvenile stages are more vulnerable and susceptible to say predation and uh, these guys have the amazing ability to oh. these guys have the ability to uh, take materials from their surroundings and cover themselves to blend in more effectively so here if you can see you can see the eye clearly here if you follow my cursor and the antennae are fairly well visible there are uh, one leg here one leg here and one in front and what it does is it's taken dirt and mud from around itself and covered its body and that makes it blend in even better uh, with its background um, also what these uh, same assassin bug species as nymphs what they do uh, in some cases is the carcasses of the prey that they have fed on they will collect them pile them on like one big bundle and carry them on their backs so that way they can hide under that bundle and if under attack they just drop that entire bundle and run to safety and whatever is trying to feed on it will probably get a bit confused as to uh, uh, which is the creature and which is the decoy so another example of uh, fantastic uh, camouflage and this by the way is a bit different from other cases because this guy actually goes out and covers himself with material in order to blend in it's uh, not just the uh, its own body that has evolved to be like that but uh, it has a sense of uh, the fact that you know it cannot blend in all naturally and go through this process of covering itself uh, this is what we call a plant hopper um, Dicoptera species and these guys are often found on the tree trunks of banyan tree this case also uh, this was shot on a banyan tree and uh, if you look I mean if you're passing by the tree trunk it's very very likely that you will walk past it without even noticing something is there so even when you look at the close-up you can see how uh, beautifully the coloration the pattern everything matches so well with the tree and the same thing uh, if you can imagine without the focus without the right sort of lighting they mm, the camouflage works brilliantly on trees um so here again we are back to leaf litter and uh, in the leaf litter 
some of you might have spotted the little grasshopper by now and this is what it is so these grasshoppers this is a genus called Fleoba and the Fleoba as a genus is known for some very cryptic sort of patterns and uh, body uh, coloration so I've seen Fleoba in many sort of habitats so uh, this uh, I mean mostly of almost always on the ground but uh, in terms of uh, different uh, uh, places wherein uh, let's say one would be a riverside where the soil would be darker and the ground reality would be a bit different uh, this is uh, for example in an agri area where the uh, soil color is different the leaf litter is a different of nature and most places i've seen that the uh, morphs that they have the each species will often be the kind that will blend in to the surrounding that they belong to so like for example uh, this is uh, and you know their body coloration and the pattern almost looks like they've been carved out of wood I'll show you another example so here again uh, on the ground in the leaf litter but if you look at the background it's all shades of gray and this guy himself is pretty much exactly that shades of gray and uh, nymph of the same species Fleoba. Now back to another moth and uh, this guy is happily sitting on a tree trunk and uh, very easy to miss this guy as well. Now this is a moth that is fairly common even in urban areas and uh, what happens is uh, I've had this moth fly into my room or into my house uh, multiple times and it's a really beautiful moth. It's got some really uh, incredible patterns on its wings. And when I've seen it on the wall a few times and I've wondered, this is like a Persian carpet, you know, such intricate details on its wings. But when you see it on a wall or if you see it indoors, you don't really realize why it has those sort of patterns. And when you look at it in the wild where these patterns work in its favor for hiding it in plain sight is when you realize why it is so so this is a spodoptera species uh, fairly common moth again fairly well distributed in the country again another moth showing, showing some pretty uh, good camouflage now this guy was uh, a bit high up uh, from a tree hanging and uh, it's just a dry leaf that i walk past and something sort of clicked in my head and then took a few steps back and noticed that there is actually something hiding there uh, this is a moth from family crambidae uh, again a kind of snout moth and uh, effortlessly blending into its background catydids now catydids are basically a kind of cricket they are also called bush crickets and uh, bush crickets again uh, as nymphs, as I said, uh, you know, in the juvenile stages are more uh, vulnerable and so on. But catydids in particular are absolute masters of the trade, uh, not only in their nymph forms, but also in their adult forms. So this guy uh, is a nymph. Uh, you can tell easily a nymph from an adult because most nymphs, uh, well, all nymphs don't have wings and most adults do. So here you see is the abdomen of the catydid and these long stalks are the two antennae uh, the front pair of legs here and two pairs of legs here so i in fact after taking the picture and taking a closer look realized it might even be feeding on the new leaves and the fronds but uh, well that's just uh, speculation but nonetheless the uh, you know i was uh, walking around close to this plant for some 15 20 minutes shooting various bugs and i absolutely missed this guy many times over till by chance i luckily happened to find it and uh, another very popular example of uh, camouflage is uh, the oak leaf butterfly so again we have a few species a uh, few species of uh, oak leaf butterfly in the country this is the Sahyadri oak leaf and when they uh, their wings are closed and uh, they sit on a tree trunk they can very easily pass off as a dry leaf but when 
they spread their wings and they want to bask in the sun they can be quite a dazzling spectacle so the same creature with wings closed and with wings open such a world of a difference and these are the abilities <clears throat> that they have evolved over millions of years for their own protection so that was a few cases in terms of camouflage and uh, here we'd like to uh, talk a bit about mimicry of various types so mimicry as you all might know is pretending to be someone or something else um, like going a bit off topic there are many people who mimic let's say movie stars or celebrities or politicians and so on but nevertheless so in the animal kingdom also mimicry is fairly common and by the way it's not just the animal kingdom. There are even plants that are known uh, to have displayed such traits. There is a plant particularly, uh, I can recall having read in uh, a paper where the plant produces its seeds that looks like a ball of dung and the dung beetles get fooled into thinking that it's dung and they bury it in the ground and the plant thereby ends up propagating itself. So mimicry is a fairly common uh, trait that found in nature, not just with animals, but here we're looking at a few animals, a few insects particularly, who display this amazing ability. So one type of mimicry or one uh, creature that is mimicked very often in nature are ants. And uh, this ability for creatures to mimic ants is called uh, mimicomorphy. But mimicomorphy as a term might say that morphologically or visibly it mimics ants, whereas in reality, many creatures uh, mimic not just uh, the ants visually, but also in terms of the chemicals and the pheromones that they produce. So one might wonder why so many creatures will be, will be uh, would have evolved to mimic tiny little insignificant ants. So <clears throat> there are uh, some various and valid reasons for that, uh, one being that these guys are social animals. They are social animals as against uh, solitary ones. So they basically live in large numbers and large colonies when they are out uh, to uh, foray and to scout for food or so on. Also, they are out in numbers. Uh, very rarely do they go out uh, solitary. So basically means that when a predator is trying to attack an ant, it is uh, it can be pretty sure that the ant would not be alone if it tries to get one or two of them for certain 10, 20 or more can join it within a matter of seconds. So that is one reason, uh, but also ants produce what is called formic acid. So formic acid is something that can be a great irritant to uh, any predator and it could deliver this formic acid, say by spray, by its sting, and uh, so, you know, various uh, species have evolved to do this in various ways. And uh, also, they are known to be quite aggressive, especially when it comes to defending their uh, colony and territory. And uh, that it does also with its very strong jaws. So basically, overall, ants are creatures that in the uh, natural world are known to be quite formidable and many predators have learned the hard way that it's best to avoid them and therefore many other creatures have come to mimic them. We'll have a look at a few examples and uh, coming back to our uh, nymphs. So like uh, I've said a few times already, the uh, creatures when they are in their nymph stages, when they are juveniles, they don't yet have developed wings, they are more susceptible to predation and so on. They have lesser field experience. They, uh, you know, so much uh, learning that has not happened yet and so on. So in, uh, this is a genus called Odontomantis. They are, they are called itself ant mantises, in fact, by many people. And uh, these ant mantises in their nymph stage, when they are really small, look like tiny black ants, as you can see over here. And as they go along, as they grow uh, through the various stages of being a nymph, they keep getting bigger and their coloration keeps changing to 
closer to becoming a full mantis, but nevertheless retaining that uh, resemblance to ants. In fact, in uh, at a later stage, when they are larger and greener, uh, many times they can also resemble the queen of weaver ants. So queen of weaver ants is usually uh, fairly large and green, and uh, therefore having a fairly similar uh, resemblance in certain stages of development. So here is a typical example of ant mimic. And this is an adult of the same species, just to show you that as adults, they don't and they don't need to mimic ants. This guy's got fully developed wings. It's, uh, you know, uh, in a much better position to defend itself and escape uh, a possible attack. So here again is uh, a true bug, a true bug basically from the family Elididae which are also called broad-headed bugs. Now, these broad-headed bugs also in their nymph stage. So here, I think this guy took the award of ant mimicry uh, in my opinion, because the body structure, the morphology is so similar except for this little mouth part. So true bugs have uh, what is called as proboscis, uh, which they have as mouth parts to pierce into, say, the stems of plants or so on to suck the sap, which is not the case with ants, by the way. As we discussed earlier, they've got jaws and their entire feeding mechanism and mouth parts are totally different. So, uh, fantastic case of ant mimicry in nymph stage. This on the left is a fairly early stage of development. And here on the right is a much later stage and still retaining characteristics of ants, but nonetheless um, getting closer to looking more like it uh, it's adult and here's a look at what the adult looks like which is nothing like an ant whatsoever so very different from its uh, nymph stage because simply it doesn't need to look like an ant in again a cat he did and again a nymph and this guy was really happily walking all over the plant, striking poses. But uh, it took me a while to figure after a few shots that this is actually not an ant. And in fact, from, well, only after I saw the pictures, I realized it's a catidid nymph. And uh, it's easy to tell by their hind legs. So catidids, grasshoppers, these guys have uh, sort of exaggerated hind legs that helps them hop and so on. And um, another typical case of fantastic ant mimicry by nymphs. This is another plant hopper, but instead of uh, being found on trees like Dicoptera, what we saw earlier, this guy is often found on the ground. So you find them in like leaf litter or amongst tiny vegetation on the ground and so on. And if you see the top half of its body, it's exactly like mud color. And when it's on the ground, and if you're looking at it from above, you can pretty much hardly see anything. And if you do look at it from the, uh, from the side, as we are seeing now, and if it was on the ground, this black part of it is all that we would have been able to notice, which makes it look a lot like an ant. And not only uh, that, but what this guy also does is, uh, if you notice, this guy doesn't have antennae. Most plant hoppers don't. Uh, well, they do, but not like ants. And uh, so what this guy will do is hold its two front legs up and wave them around like they are antennae. So thereby increasing the resemblance to ants uh, because of its behavior. And beetles are not uh, far behind in this race to look like ants. Uh, many beetles, probably dozens or even hundreds of species uh, have, this, uh, have developed this ability to mimic ants. There's an entire family called Anthicidae. Uh, they're called uh, ant mimic beetles, in fact. They're called ant beetles. And uh, the entire family of mm, like so many species and genera are all ant mimics. So it's a fairly common uh, trait that we see in nature. And uh, now there is also uh, the beaver ant that I was talking about earlier, the 
the one that has a green queen and the one that mantis uh, looks alike that I was talking about. So here is a weaver ant and it is standing on its nest and like everything else that uh, lives in colony that has a social structure, uh, these ants as well have a very well defined division of labor and uh, there anything that uh, lives in a nest uh, with a social structure will also have certain uh, individuals that have been appointed the duty of sentry sentry basically means they are standing guard to defend and protect the nest so either ways they can be quite uh, aggressive uh, especially if you're trying to come close to the nest or if you're in their way for anything that they're trying to achieve and this little jumping spider here on the right is uh, well despite it being a spider still likes to look like this ant so basically what it does is uh, not just now we must understand another thing at this uh, point is that these creatures have developed this mimicry not to fool us humans so usually they have developed this mimicry to stay safe from a predator that would be scared of this ant so let's say there's a frog and uh, let's say a frog is uh, you know ha knows that it shouldn't go close to a weaver ant colony and uh, so this uh, jumping spider by looking like a um, weaver ant and by living among weaver ants is able to stay safe from such predators and what happens also is that other than fooling the frog or the lizard it needs to fool the ants which is most important because the ants are not going to let one spider like a predator come and live with, uh, among them so what they also do is they also mimic the chemicals and the pheromones with which the ants recognize each other so uh, ant vision is not exactly that strong or that sharp like humans have so they uh, their most uh, important and strong sensory perception is chemoreception which in a sense is like smell and uh, by adapting uh, so it's not yet clear whether the spider actually produces these pheromones or whether it uh, by um, being amongst them or uh, uh, you know kind of gets these pheromones onto itself and so on so uh, classic example of Batesian mimicry which is basically that one creature has evolved to mimic another creature to stay safe from a third group of creatures and uh, now other than ant mimic another very common kind of mimicry is wasp mimics I'm sure most of us humans here have uh, you know come across a wasp colony or an individual wasp and gone the other way everybody knows almost by instinct that these guys are not to be messed with and a lot of creatures in the wild do take advantage of this very fact and try to stay safe from predators so this by the way is uh, what is called a soldier fly and uh, it's a fairly common fly even uh, especially people who are uh, who are into some sort of composting at home or at their farms uh, these the larvae of these uh, flies are very very essential in uh, basically decomposing and composting so uh, coming back to its mimicry uh, flies by the way don't have such long antennae usually so the reason why this particular species has developed such long antennae is also because this species mimics a certain kind of wasp and in order to have that mimicry effect, uh, effective it has evolved such long antennae the entire body plan and structure and morphology is very similar in terms of coloration and shape to that wasp that it mimics the uh, wings of this uh, fly also has a certain sort of a transparent um, notch or a window uh, which again is uh, similar to the wasp that it mimics uh, also the coloration of its legs and so on so there are various features in a mimic that makes it look similar to the uh, species that it does mimic and by doing so 
it remains safe so these guys are basically uh, you know creatures that feed on detritus which is basically debris basically organic waste and convert them into compost and so on so in that sense uh, you know they are harmless little guys doing a great deal of service uh, to the ecosystem but in order to protect themselves they have uh, evolved this incredible ability to just look like wasps and stay out of trouble and uh, there are these whole lot of moths that uh, especially this tribe called syntomeni uh, to which these uh, moths belong and uh, so syntomeni uh, basically they are called also handmaiden moths and so on so these um, syntomeni tribe uh, many of the species actually feed on toxic plants and uh, so basically that makes them uh, themselves toxic and unpalatable to many predators and therefore that is, works as their defense mechanism but in this tribe there is a genus called amata and amata is not known to feed on any such toxic plants but nonetheless uh, has developed these beautiful bright orange stripes that is said to resemble wasps and uh, so this is a slightly debatable point uh, according to me is that uh, on one hand you can say that this uh, moth uh, resembles a wasp and in which case again is a typical example of batesian mimicry where one creature mimics another creature to stay safe from another bunch of creatures whereas maybe it is also a case of what is called as mullerian mimicry mullerian basically muller what he proposed is that perhaps a group of creatures evolved to look the same way and uh, by doing so as a collective group are uh, you know share the advantage of um, staying safe from predation so either ways uh, but nevertheless this one creature can actually uh, you know give you a sense of these two totally different concepts of mimicry again a fly uh, these guys are called uh, stilt legged flies a family called micropezidae and uh, so various species of this family resemble various hymenopterans which basically in this case means ants and wasps uh, so this guy for example uh, i think is probably mimicking a wasp from the family ichneumonidae now ichneumons are basically uh, parasitoids and uh, they again have a very similar uh, body structure as this guy here which is basically thin and long and uh, they have black antennae most of the times with uh, white bands like how you can see at the end of this leg and this by the way is a leg is uh, the front pair of legs and uh, as i said usually flies have really tiny antennae so these actually are the antennae of the fly and it holds its uh, front legs out and waves it around like as if a wasp is waving around its antennae so not only is there a mimicry in terms of the morphology but also its behavior adds on to that effect and by the way i've seen uh, a few other uh, species of uh, stilt legged flies out in the field uh, some of them i've seen to be just uh, the perfect shade of brown to uh, look like a uh, a paper wasp there are some known to mimic ants and for the same reason now uh, wasps too are aggressive they too can sting they have stingers they too are capable of uh, uh, giving out formic acid they too are capable of producing various other chemicals that they use for their defense uh, again very strong jaws and uh, being social creatures they can very aggressively defend their nest and their colonies so for very similar reasons to that of ants uh, wasps are also formidable and uh, you know creatures that not many other creatures would like to get on the wrong side of here's a little fruit fly now 
the fruit fly, as the name suggests, all it cares about is to lay its eggs in the fruit and, you know, take forward its uh, lineage. But like everything else that lives in the wild, there are always uh, too many threats that it needs to deal with on a regular basis. And in order to do so, it has evolved uh, the mimicry to a wasp. And in fact, this little <clears throat> uh, fruit fly, uh, Bactrocera species. Now, Bactrocera, I've seen in many cases, is very good at fooling humans, at least, because the uh, like on iNaturalist, many times I've seen many posts where someone would see a Bactrocera po uh, post a picture of it and uh, tag it as a moth, uh, as a wasp. So I'm sure the uh, predators that it's trying to escape from uh, often mistake it as well. And uh, like I said, beetles are never behind in the race. So here's a longhorn beetle. This uh, is an uh, Indian species. This particular longhorn uh, basically lives in and on bamboo. And uh, it's a fairly harmless uh, little guy as long as you are not a bamboo. So basically means that it doesn't have a lot of uh, tricks up its sleeve. Uh, mostly any creature with this sort of a black and yellow or black and orange combination are often interpreted as wasp mimics, but uh, that's in a more sort of a loose sense. Uh, so few studies have been done in the world to actually uh, verify and confirm whether this uh, resemblance actually gives them an, an advantage in nature. So as you all might uh, be aware that uh, these traits develop through a process of natural selection and natural selection happens in uh, basically to give them uh, certain advantages in certain cases, uh, advantages in terms of survival or maybe in terms of reproduction. So nevertheless, uh, coming back to longhorn beetles, longhorn beetles, uh, a very similar wasp mimic beetle has been studied extensively in North America. And what they found is that uh, if you try to handle the beetle or if you try to sort of interact with it physically, it gives away certain defensive, uh, it secretes some defensive chemicals. And these defensive chemicals, they studied uh, in a lot of detail and found that the active compounds that makes these defensive chemicals um, sort of uh, unfavorable to creatures is the same sort of active compounds that are found in the chemicals sprayed by wasps. So in fact, some of these creatures that have been studied, it has been shown that they are, uh, you know, uh, uh, mimic of wasps and that indeed they give them an advantage in their survival. Dung. Now, dung or poop or whatever name, feces you want to call it by, uh, basically old saying, nothing goes waste in nature and one creature's waste is another creature's food. And uh, so for this purpose, Various creatures have evolved to basically look like shit. Now, dung is, uh, like I said, one's waste is another's food. So there are a lot of creatures that actually feed on dung. And this uh, two types of creatures have taken advantage of this fact and used it for their own purposes. We'll have a look at a few examples. So this is a very common butterfly. The Papilio butterflies, uh, this, if I'm not mistaken, is the, uh, um, this is from a curry patta plant at home. And uh, so if you look at this guy sitting on a leaf, it just looks like some bird dropping that has fallen from a tree above. And if I was, let's say, a garden lizard, or if I was a spider prowling around for food, I'm definitely not going to give this guy another second look. Uh, same, Papilio butterfly, this one's on leaf, uh, on a lime leaf, uh, most likely Papilio demolius. And um, again, looking like bird poop, happily crawling around on the leaf, 
and I doubt any predator, bird, lizard, anything is going to give it a second look because they are not interested. The, the predators don't feed on poop, by the way. There are a whole bunch of other creatures that do feed on poop, uh, like butterflies itself, for example. Many butterflies uh, feed on different types of poop because of certain minerals that they find in them. Uh, there are, of course, the dung beetles, which is a huge, huge um, group of animals. And uh, there are various types of dung beetles, the rollers and uh, diggers and ones who live inside dung. And there are various flies uh, who feed on dung. There are, I've seen termites in, uh, you know, piles of dung. I've seen, uh, other than insects, there are also slugs and a lot of mammals are known to feed on dung. I'm sure people who have dogs have seen this behavior uh, a few times. So it's not at all uncommon to have creatures feed on poop. And many, uh, uh, so that reason apart, the fact is that creatures that do look like poop for sure are going to be safe from predators because predators are not the ones who do feed on poop. But like I said, uh, there are some predators themselves who have developed this ability to look like uh, poop. And uh, this here is a crab spider. A crab spider is basically an ambush hunter, which basically means that it's going to wait and uh, wait for a sit and wait for some prey to come by. So let's say a butterfly is flying over it or a fly and it sees a fresh poo pile of poop on a leaf. It's going to come closer, thinking that it's bird dung. And once it does come closer, this guy is going to grab it with both hands, uh, deliver its venom, and make lunch out of it. And you see, it's not just its body that uh, it uses to look like poop. It spreads its silk all over the leaf here to look like a splatter, to just make it look more natural. So you see, this guy is so well defined although it still might pass off as some bird poop or reptile poop. But this guy here, I think, is a lot more realistic to have that sort of a splatter effect uh, with its silk and works very well for predators. Uh, this is a predator, again, a spider. But uh, in my uh, view, at least, I think it uses uh, the dung mimicry as its own protection because these guys are nocturnal. Uh, so basically at night, they will build their orb web in order to capture prey. And uh, by morning, they'll be back on the plant and hiding and waiting for the night to come again. And while they are all day on this plant, they need to be safe from potential predators. And what better way to stay safe from predators than like, looking like poop. So a lot of creatures have developed this uh, tongue mimicry to for various purposes of their own. A very classic example of mimicry also is in butterfly. So here on the left, we have what is called the plain tiger butterfly. Um, plain tiger butterfly some of their known larval host plants basically means that the caterpillars of these uh, plain tiger butterflies, some of them feed on very toxic plants. Uh, one example would be the Indian milkweed. So a milkweed, uh, again, fairly well distributed in India and uh, it grows wild on roadsides and in fields and so on. And most of you might even know that the sap of this plant is pretty toxic. So when caterpillars feed on this milkweed plant, they are actually consuming the, uh, the toxic sap and storing it in their bodies for their defense, which basically makes them unpalatable and toxic themselves. So over time, the, the predator community uh, has figured that, okay, we need to leave this plain tiger butterfly alone because these guys are toxic. And this denied egg fly here takes advantage of this and has evolved to look like the plain tiger. It doesn't feed on any toxic plants itself, but by looking like, again, a typical case of Batesian mimicry, where one creature 
resembles another creature to stay safe from another group of creatures. So, by the way, let me show you. <clears throat> uh, in the case of Danaid egg flies, only the females uh, have this mimicry. So, this actually is what the male looks like, which is entirely different from the female. Of course, it's called egg fly for a reason because they have these egg like markings all over their wings, which is not at all the case with this female. As you can see, the female is just happy looking like the plain tiger because it can easily stay alive that way. So another classic example of Batesian mimicry in butterflies. And then there is what is called as aggressive mimicry. Now, aggressive mimicry, as the name suggests, um, is when a creature uh, so, for example, the crab spider we saw on a leaf that looks like poop. So that is a sort of an aggressive mimicry where it's looking like poop to uh, basically meal, make a meal out of uh, unsuspecting creatures. The same way, uh, if any of you are into gardening or into uh, agriculture, I'm sure you will know what a mealy bug is. A mealy bug is definitely not a gardener or a farmer's friend at all. And this guy here, a scale insect, is basically mealybugs are scale insects too. <clears throat> so this scale insect here is, uh, <clears throat> you know, found in large numbers. They are not solitary uh, animals again. And uh, a ladybug larva. So these ladybugs are from the subfamily called uh, Skymnine. So these uh, larvae of ladybugs have evolved to mimic scale insects and they not only look like scale insects they live among the scale insects and scale insects are also their favorite kind of food so this is what uh, basically means uh, by aggressive mimicry so in order to uh, their aggression is towards the creature they are mimicking basically and aggression basically means they want to eat them and uh, another case so we had a look at uh, weaver ants uh, some time back and we saw how one jumping spider has evolved to mimic these ants. And this is another kind of a crab spider, a Mycia species. And these two have evolved, if you can see. Now this is the weaver ant and this is the crab spider. So spiders, as you all might know, have four pairs of legs and insects have three pairs of legs and one pair of antennae so this spider as you can see is holding its legs up like as if they are antennae of ants and uh, doing quite a good job of mimicking uh, one of these weaver ants and also feeding on it so another typical example of what is called as aggressive mimicry back to some more catadids so this little guy was stuck on a wall and I actually walked past it a few times just thinking that, okay, because of rain, something is stuck on a wall. It's a leaf that flew by or whatever. And uh, only when I took a closer look that I realized that it's actually a catadid. And uh, so this entire leaf-like body is the wings and this leaf stalk here is basically its antennae so it uh, you know even the central vein of the leaf that goes on to the stalk so the whole body plan and the way it holds its antennae together everything is just to resemble perfectly a leaf uh, let me show you a closer uh, picture of the same guy basically you can see closer now on the wings how these patterns resemble the cells of a leaf, beautifully uh, mimicking that. And uh, its tiny head with its eye and the long antennae that makes it look like the leaf stalk. So again, catadids is another group which are uh, very, very um, uh, well adapted in these sort of traits. Again, another kind of a leaf mimic catadid. This one's a nymph because as you can see, uh, it's got the wings are still growing, uh, tiny leaf buds that have emerged. 
so this was on a neem tree about my height and uh, on one branch i was seeing some um, uh, movement and uh, so i just stood there with my camera and i was wondering what it is and i was wondering what if it's like a snake comes out of it or whatever you know so uh so i'm just looking for bugs i'm uh, not exactly prepared for snakes so i stood there for a few minutes looking at uh, you know what it is that is making all this movement and then emerged this little guy here just blending in perfectly and uh, i'll let me show you an adult of the same species and these are by the way at least in madras they are not at all uncommon i've had them fly into my bedroom a couple of times this one sitting on a car and uh, so well yes uh, also i um, often see them in and around neem trees i don't know if they are if there's a association uh, particularly that has been studied with them and neem trees uh, maybe they are generalist feeders can't say but either ways the mimicry uh, and the resemblance to a leaf is what is in question here and i think they do a pretty cool job with it so another grasshopper and uh, this one is a mimic of a dead leaf or basically a dry leaf again for uh, fairly obvious reasons uh, a predator who is looking at eating an insect is not really going to get excited by a dry leaf which is why it's makes perfect sense to look like one so this is uh, from a genus called phylocoria now in phylocoria i have seen uh, they also have green morphs so there are actually individuals that would even look like fresh leaf so again it's a very simple sort of a deduction that uh, creatures that eat leaves are not a threat and creatures that don't eat leaves are not going to get excited by it so basically it's happy for uh, this guy to be looking the way it does mantises are again a really and per personally probably one of my favorites and also otherwise a really fascinating group of creatures this guy as you can see is just standing on a plant looking like a twig and uh, if not for its slight movement i probably would not have noticed it and um, very easily blending in and not giving away what it is another kind of mantis uh, many people confuse these for stick insects in fact they are mantises uh, also called the indian grass mantis as you can see fantastic mimicry of a blade of grass when they are out in nature and when they are standing let's say on the ground or near grass or on grass it's very difficult to spot these guys uh, this guy was walking uh, on the ground which is how i managed to catch uh, attention of it and uh, and well uh, picked it up for a couple of pictures and uh, these guys not only uh, morphologically not only uh, look wise do they resemble a blade of grass but you seen how grass sways in the wind their movement is exactly like that so they too would sway as if a blade of grass is swaying in the wind uh, fantastic mimicry and uh, incredible camouflage so i mean yeah it's pretty much uh, in many cases mimicry camouflage it all sorts of sort of merges into the same um, result this again is a nymph uh, again a mantis so because it's a nymph the wings are not developed which is why the mimicry is even more effective the camouflage and these guys are called bark mimic mantises doesn't mean that they bark obviously it just means that they found on tree trunks and uh, have evolved to look just, to just blend in perfectly so um, all uh, mantises by the way are predators themselves uh, nonetheless they are also absolute masters in the trade of mimicry and camouflage this is a very popular uh, species of mantis called the violent mantis or the rose mantis or the wandering mantis and um, 
these guys are basically their body plan or the structure is such that they just look like twigs and leaves. Uh, let me show you a closer look, like the long legs and the long neck and little tufts of leaves here and there, which are, of course, its body parts. So uh, very easily blending in again. And uh, these guys too, very much like the grass mantis I was talking about, their movement, uh, the way they move also is uh, very cryptic. It looks like just a tiny twig or uh, some leaves swaying in the wind. And, uh, you know, like uh, some of you might have uh, seen chameleons. So if you've seen a chameleon, it will take one step forward and half a step back and one step forward and half a step back. Very similar sort of a movement that even some of these mantises uh, make in order to mimic basically plant life or their background. We had uh, started uh, uh, with a nymph of an assassin bug, if you remember. So assassin bugs come in all shapes and sizes. This is uh, from a totally different subfamily altogether. And uh, nonetheless, they are pretty uh, incredible predators. And some of them, as you can see, have some fantastic camouflage as well. So here's a closer look at its uh, body and uh, blending in totally effortlessly. And then there's an entire order, uh, which uh, so basically, if you are not familiar, mm, like flies make up one order, beetles make up one order, mantises make up one order, like that there's an entire order of, uh, called stick insects with insects that mimic sticks and leaves. So here's a, a stick insect that I saw uh, last year. Mm, let me explain you in case you're not familiar. This here is where its tiny little head is. And from to the right of its head all along, it's basically holding its front two pairs of uh, front pair of uh, legs and its antennae in a straight line aligned with its body. Totally aligned like this to look like a long twig and one pair of legs, second pair of legs. So uh, incredible creatures to see in the wild. If again, if I had not seen it on the ground like this uh, on like Pakka ground, I could have easily missed it if it was on a plant. And uh, also in the same order, like I said, the leaf insects. So here's an example of a leaf insect. Um, here's the little head, two tiny antennae, first pair of legs, second pair of legs, and the third pair of legs. These are the wings and the abdomen and so on. So fantastic uh, mimicry of uh, twigs and leaves. And uh, this is the order of stick insects. So, um, okay, I'll come to the topic of eye spots or diematic displays. So a lot of creatures don't in fact evolve the ability to mimic other creatures or uh, their environment, but they develop ability to scare away predators. So you see how this insect, uh, this butterfly, I, I personally found it really cute. It almost looks like human eyes. But this butterfly, as you can imagine, will be about what, this big? And it's got eyes almost the size of a human, which basically to a predator makes it look like it's a much larger creature than it actually is. So this ability of making it look a lot larger than it actually is, is what is called diametic displays, which is basically a form of defense against predators. So we'll have a look at a few more examples. Um, very common in moths and uh, butterflies also. So here is a popular moth, which is called the Luna moth or uh, Actea silene and uh, also called moon moths. They're called moon moths or lunar moths because of these spots, but these spots basically are what are also referred to as ice spots. So here you see 
this these guys are like really tiny also a moth by the way and these um, black markings you can see here are known to mimic the eyes of a jumping spider now creatures that are about in this size range know that jumping spiders are formidable hunters with a very keen eyesight and probably amongst the better um, vision in the spider world these jumping spiders have so by having eye spots that mimic jumping spiders which is a known hunter these guys are able to stay safe from other potential predators a very common moth again uh, this is erebus erebus species and again large eye spots that can have the effect of these diagmatic displays uh, saturnia species this one is from arunachal and again large eye spots all over its two pairs of wings and not only adults but as you can see here this is a moth caterpillar and uh, a sphinx moth or a hawk moth caterpillar and how these caterpillars also have these large eye spots that basically make them uh, look larger than they are the actual caterpillar eyes would be somewhere here near its uh, mouth and they're like in a very small cluster of tiny eyes so this of course is not its real eye it can't see through it it's just dynamic display and that brings us to the end of this show and uh, thank you all for stopping by and um, Devi ji and can I stop scaring, uh, sharing please, the please, screen? Uh, please do that uh, sir you can really stop sharing the screen and we can have some questions from the audience. I first of all thank you for this extensive uh, talk and uh, this was really nice to know such a lot about so many creatures which uh, uh, mimic and get camouflaged into their environment. I think the audience must have enjoyed maybe uh, many people do not relate to insects uh, as they should because of so I'm many sure. reasons because uh, not not yes not many would understand and not many would have the patience to uh, like you said you pass by a dry leaf and not many would have the patience to look at it that way to actually discover something which is there nearby so uh, yes true entomology has uh, been uh, undermined to an extent but uh, the one who is a true blooded zoologist will always know or a passion driven uh, naturalist like you would always know what it means to when you observe insects. Uh, so if any questions audience please put up we have uh, Anubhav and we can have them answered to an extent. Yes, uh, at least some of them. Uh, Anubhav could you read the question at 549 Rahul Ranjan needs to ask something I guess he needs to ask something is at it visible five, to you mm, 549 at, at 549 there's no Rahul Ranjan I'm not able to see can you check the time again it's 549 Oh, sorry. It's 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 put to me only. Maybe. Oh, uh, okay. So he says, uh, during my study, I found species A and species B is morphologically almost similar to it. But when we go for the genital dissection, it is totally different. So we find out that it is some kind of mimicry. And uh, if it is so, then how do I know that who is mimicking whom? So this is basically a very, uh, you know, observational question. But um, yeah, would you look like to go ahead and answer? Uh, see, firstly, when we are talking about mimics, uh, when we say that one species mimics another species, it basically means that those two species are quite unrelated to each other. So like right. wasps and moths are totally unrelated, other than the fact that they are insects. So in that sense, if you are uh, catching two species that look similar, but by genital analysis, you are figuring out that they are actually different species. 
if they are closely related it's not even called mimicry and uh, so if you could elaborate a bit further maybe uh, i would be in a better position to understand uh, no, also a lot of environmental factors are there to uh, uh, contribute to this particular phenomenon, which is called mimicry. Because if you take the case of the night fly itself, uh, uh, which you have already portrayed as an example, uh, upon being palatable as a species to be preyed upon by geckos or birds or whoever uh, comes into the predator category, that decides whom they actually mimic. So who is mimicking whom is really a question when you can only observe the whole, um, uh, the whole, uh, you know, the related species across, along with the other one uh, which you have. Observed. So it cannot be actually uh, said by looking at just two individuals after is mimicking whom we do not have uh, prior data about them. So that that really goes into a lot of ethology and uh, observational behavior to be studied. Yeah. Also, like I mentioned a couple of times, that uh, there are types of mimicry which uh, yes. two of them being Batesian and Mullerian. So in the case right. of Batesian mimicry, uh, as you uh, cited the example of the plain tiger and the denied egg fly, uh, in that case, of course, it's Batesian and uh, there are three groups of organisms over there. And even in the Mullerian mimicry, there are multiple groups of organisms which is forming this common cluster of similar looking creatures which share this advantage so i think it would uh, probably help to have a little more specifics and uh, you know to right understand where to fit it in so there is another the, uh, a similar question which comes up from ashwarya why only the female denied egg fly she means to say not egg lay mimics the tiger uh, plain tiger butterfly uh, so See, I think, um, let me try and simplify it uh, by saying that um, basically traits, genetic traits are, mm, you know, have a cost. And uh, one uh, reason why females uh, might need uh, or might be able to afford this cost of this trait is because uh, they need to stay safe in order to uh, let able their to take off the to, progeny yeah to basically uh, reproduce and take their species further uh, is uh, my guess but of course it's not um, something that i have uh, read or studied about also another hypothesis which has been put up anubhav as i have come across some text says that the denied egg fly female is much more palatable than the plain tiger butterfly. It is. If you it look is, at yeah. the, exactly. So if you look at the plain tiger, wherever it goes about flying, the denied egg fly female also follows. Meaning to say that uh, looking at the plain tiger, not many geckos and birds would be interested to pick it up. So the denied exactly. egg fly almost dodges the prey predators and saves itself uh, for the progeny, like you said, to go ahead and be able to lay eggs. So let Absolutely. us take Swaroop's question. Uh, uh, how does an organism decide which other organism to mimic? So Swaroop, this was what we were basically addressing a little while ago. Also, suppose organism one mimics another organism two, then how does it protect itself from the predators of the organism two? <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, of course, nothing is foolproof. Yeah. Uh, not in nature, not outside nature. Absolutely nothing is foolproof. Uh, so uh, let's say, and let's take also i'm sorry lot of exceptions also they cannot oh, be yes. a rule when mimicry True. comes into picture yeah so see you must understand that these um, sort of uh, hypotheses or uh, theories that we discuss is right. the human understanding of what's happening around us which i'm not undermining i'm saying that's great uh, the things that we have figured out so far but uh, basically Let's take an example of this weaver ant and um, the jumping spider. Now, the jumping spider will have the comfort of uh, being mm, safe from, let's say, birds or let's say a garden lizard. But there might be uh, there might be a chameleon who can sit on a branch far away and shoot out its tongue and catch hold of a prey. So, right. in this case, it's not 
you know it's the uh, it is still every creature has to defend itself irrespective of what sort of morphological traits or not and abilities or not so these are just sort of um, you know an additional uh, safety cover but it doesn't mean that you live uh, without any threat at all threat this like i mean this we're talking about only predation like other than predation there could be so many threats so it's just that uh, you know these provide them some cushion some mm, cushion of safety but doesn't mean that it can stop worrying Absolutely about right. it still has to take okay. care of it look out for predators and so on uh, dr anjan prusti uh, sends across his regards he was really uh, very happy with the talk we Thank move you. ahead to sarva goswami who says uh, she needs to ask that sir is mimicry a physical or behavioral adaptation or is it both it is more than just yeah. both of these uh, so of course it is uh, physical which is uh, morphological basically the body structure and so on it is behavioral in, uh, i'm sorry trait wise yeah it is also behavioral in the sense like how i said uh now a spider or a fly that doesn't have long enough uh, antennae well spider doesn't have antennae at all and flies don't have them long enough so in that case they hold out a pair of legs and behave like they are antennae just to fool other creatures thinking that it's a wasp and uh, how for example we saw in mantises the movement uh, that they mimic a blade of grass they mimic a twig of a plant or they um, you know so these sort of uh, behavioral adaptations are also uh, seen widely and other than these there is also what is called as uh, chemo uh, reception which is uh, mainly how the insect world perceives things around them very few have a keen eyesight like we humans do so the uh, their world basically they build uh, mental maps of the world around them by the various uh, smells and uh, mm, senses that uh, in in the way they sense the uh, uh, nature around them so basically right. meaning they'll be able to get certain smells of other creatures of plants around them of what the temperature might be what the humidity might be whether it's uh, you know those sort of things so uh, pheromones play, play a very important uh, part uh, of communication and interaction between insects and spiders so a lot of them do mimic those pheromones uh, we saw a case of a longhorn beetle where uh, the chemical that it sprays for its self defense uh, mimics that of these uh, defensive chemicals of certain wasps for example so it's not just morphological not just behavioral it's also uh, chemo in nature and uh, who knows we might come across a few other such uh, traits uh, that they use as tricks right absolutely uh, so abhishek venkat at 611 has got a question regarding scale insects with regards to the scale insect and its aggressive mimicking ladybug won't the scale insect eventually learn about this organism's deception given the difference in size and the ladybug seems much larger Then the scale insect in your slide. So, uh, the, is the size uh, difference really very huge? Mm, so over there, I think uh, it may be um, a case of me not having sized those uh, two pictures, uh, pictures well enough. Uh, but in fact, when you look at them, they are very similar in size. They are very similar. Another thing in that particular slide of mine. Uh, yeah. for the lack of better uh, for the lack of more pictures i have used uh, a scale insect and a ladybug larva which are in fact not even such good mimics of each other or rather the uh, ladybug larva isn't even a great mimic of that uh, because they are not um, so these um, ladybug larvae the uh, the bunch of scale insects that it chooses to be among will invariably be uh, the ones that they mimic well so uh, you know different species and different genera of this uh, ladybugs uh, of this subfamily will 
uh, mimic different scale insects and those uh, that resemblance will be a lot better than what you probably would have seen on the slide also with evolution does mimicry have a um, uh, have a um, you know uh, an extent till which it can uh, go ahead and beyond that uh, should it change i mean these are evolutionary questions we, we need to really uh, look for through uh, you know maybe timeline studies for example the question he is asking is really valid for example if there is a, a ant and there are spiders which are mimicking the ants would the ants not realize after a point of time that this is there is a villain amongst us who is like <laughs> trying to look alike and uh, maybe uh, steal prey or maybe prey upon them and also uh, uh, take a kind of a camouflage from the predators also like wasps definitely so uh, the thing is that this is evolution is a cat and mouse game and it's called coevolution where two creatures are constantly evolving to okay now it's not so coevolution can happen in various cases but in a case like this uh, in terms of aggressive mimicry particularly it's a cat and mouse yeah. tom and jerry sort of a situation where each one is trying to outwit the other and that is happening at an evolutionary scale wherein they are developing traits and abilities and uh, such things to be one up, uh, from the other so who knows that um, maybe there are cases or maybe we will discover some cases uh, where certain creatures have developed uh, the ability to counter these adaptations also it is uh, you know uh, these changes obviously happen over really long spans of time and uh, these changes might be happening even as we speak and you know it's just that till the so our understanding also of these creatures are rather limited so there's only uh, like you know you can pitch a tent in a jungle and observe a cat or a deer but to really get into the lives of these creatures especially in the wild uh, you know in a lab environment you can still do that to some extent but in the wild to um, really study them that much is still a bit of a challenge but uh, it's constantly evolving constantly changing it's totally dynamic and just because the equation between two creatures is one way today doesn't mean it will remain like that forever at all uh, anubhav there are there have been questions upon book suggestions uh, dr dinesh needs to ask that are there books which can deal with the evolution of ambient seeking behavior so the one which we were talking about any evolution studies on these uh, mimicry and camouflage so if you ever come across please uh, send them across to me so that i can share them on the group and the people can benefit out of them definitely i'll do that arijit asks uh, sir in your experience have you seen any insect mimicking another insect which is cannibalistic in nature i really did not know what he means to ask but uh, who is cannibalistic upon whom that needs to be checked so, so uh, see, cannibalism is very be... common i think uh, any creature that is predatory uh, spiders assassin bugs mantises um, um well any kind of predatory uh, dragonflies any kind of predatory uh, creature that you can think of does tend to be cannibalistic especially when environmental pressures uh, like for example uh, you know shortage of food or uh, lack of opportunity for food can easily uh, drive them towards cannibalism but uh, thinking about these sort of predatory creatures i can't uh, remember any that uh, i've seen other creatures mimic i'm can't think of any of them right so we can really uh, work upon that and find out if there are any actually like for example mantises now mantises uh, these the most uh, obvious sort of uh, morphological character of mantises are the raptorial hands so a lot of creatures have raptorial hands there are mantis flies which are not at all mantises there are uh, certain flies there are certain assassin bugs so various creatures have uh, evolved uh, so that could be just a um, case of convergent evolution you know uh, doesn't at all mean that uh, they are mimics of each other so but right. yeah to basically answer your question i haven't come across any such thing 
Anu need, uh, wants to ask something. Sir, I have a question not related to camouflage. I would like to ask why the insects, especially ants, do not die when they jump off from long distances. I have been really wondering about this since childhood. Related mm. to their size, even small distances can be long, but still they don't die. Of course, that is the gravity playing a role over there and nothing to do with mimicry and camouflaging. Yep. Uh, well, uh, see, uh, I might be wrong here. I'm just using common sense and answering this question. But you, uh, you threw a heavy object down from your uh, terrace, and you throw a light object down from a terrace. Most likely, the heavy one will be more damaged than the light one, especially, of course, given so many other variables and factors. So, uh, uh, like Devi said gravity is unforgiving so you know exactly. when it's a heavy and larger object the consequences accordingly are accordingly right rajesh lenka asks how aprosematism which is showing colorful display for being a poisonous one and mimicry are related uh, so how it could be related is that certain uh, certain creatures show aposomatic coloration when so uh, aposomatic coloration basically means that let's say the uh, case of a um, tiger plain tiger butterfly which we saw feeds on certain uh, toxic plants so these uh, creatures who actually are toxic and show this sort of coloration are what is actual aposomatic uh, display. But uh, let's say, for example, this Amata moth. Now, Amata moth does not feed on any uh, kind of uh, toxic plant, but still it is mm, theorized that it is a wasp mick or so on. So, and plus it also has these really bright colors that it displays. So one can say that it's mimicry because it is a bluff. So it, it's showing itself to be uh, something that is toxic, but in fact, it is not. Similar point that Devi had made about the Danite egg fly, where the females are actually very palatable. It's just that because they look like uh, the plain tiger, that it gets away uh, without being eaten as often. Correct. So is there mimicry in sounds also? Mm, I I'm not sure of that. I haven't. So the thing is, uh, with insects is uh, amongst the main uh, group of insects that produce sound are basically crickets and cicadas. Uh -huh. And I have not heard of uh, any um, sound mimicry in these two groups. Also, there are some odd other cases where some of them do produce sound, like there's some mantises who produce some amount of sound to uh, basically during their diamatic displays when they okay. flare up their wings and try to look big and menacing they'll make some they'll rub some body parts together like uh, or uh, you know vibrate some certain membranes and uh, produce this sound that makes it uh, seem intimidating or like there is a hissing cockroach for example so there aren't too many uh, groups of uh, insects that do produce sound in the first place. And uh, the ones that do, I've never so far at least come across uh, cases of mimicry. There are frogs which make sounds which sound like crickets and other insects. But there is no visible reason I can logic out as to why a frog would mimic like a cricket. Uh, 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 I, think, uh, I think that... Uh, is quite uh, possible that the frog is basically so crickets make uh, these calls basically as mating calls and if a yeah. frog is making a mating call which is similar to that of a cricket it's basically inviting its food saying that you know i want to marry you but i actually <laughs> can't eat you so, that's quite uh, plausible absolutely. <laughs> I mean, absolutely so so that is what leaves because uh, many of us many often we have been discussing uh, taxonomy in such greater details that we sometimes undermine ethology but like i always say more than naming an animal if you go about looking at what it does to your uh, um, micro ecosystem where you exactly exist 
it is of much more importance than actually putting a name to it saying uh, xyz kodaikanal xyz chennai xyz bhuvaneshwar and so absolutely. on absolutely <laughs> personal it's, opinion go but you know uh, a lot of times we come across creatures see uh, insects and spiders they such large group of insects and uh, you know there are <clears throat> morphological traits basically visual uh, characteristics are such poor indicators of the taxonomy in many cases that some would say boss if you want the full species name you get me the specimen i'm going to cut it open and i'm going to preserve it and study it and tell you it doesn't really matter what its latin name or greek name is that you have to catch the insect and cut it open and kill i don't think it's really uh relevant at all what it's called you can call it jimmy you can call it tom you can call it anubhav you can call it whatever uh the important thing is that you in you know understand its place in nature understand what function it plays and uh, the habitat needs the creature more than you and the creature needs the habitat f- far greater than uh, the other way around so it's very important that we let these guys be uh you know so i i take these uh, classes for kids and uh, try to teach them about insects so taxonomists so, will be uh, scamming us for saying this but it of, of course goes unsaid that the role of a creature or an animal in the uh, biome is way more important than what it is called and absolutely uh, uh, absolutely yeah maybe people are open to differ in their opinion so uh, there is a, there is another question which says uh, yeah there were a lot of about sound and mimicry and everything is gone uh, sunil kumar asks something very interesting sir how do how do the insect nymphs get the idea as to on which tree should they stay uh, or which premise uh, to come camouflage so that they can stick to the same color as their own so what happens This- often is uh, firstly uh, like how we humans we uh, let's say there's a fancy dress party a costume party so we go out and get this costume to look like whatever else and so it doesn't work like that these guys have these traits by evolution so they are born to mimic or uh, you know to be camouflaged and so on so uh, it is not a conscious decision and which tree uh, or which plant they are found on is often a decision made by their mother so many okay. times like in the case of butterflies and moths uh, you know the uh, caterpillars have known limited associated uh, host plants so let's say uh, we saw that the common barren is often found on mango right but that doesn't mean that you will find a plain tiger on a mango tree a plain tiger you will find in a uh, kya bolte hain milkweed plant or other host plants uh, barren you will find on mango or other host plants so the uh, mother butterfly who's going to lay its eggs will lay the eggs only on the plant where it knows its young ones can feed on in the case of uh, the creature being predatory in that case also uh, the Mm, the species of the plant doesn't matter but what matter is the availability of prey and in that also in most cases what happens is with the predatory creatures when uh, till they go through one or two molts they don't even start their predat- predatory life and they, they will live in a small cluster and they will start uh, dispersing and only after uh, dispersing and radiating in all directions slowly after a couple of molts will they uh, get into this predation mode so it works differently with uh, creatures who are predators differently with creatures who have specific host plants and creatures who are generalist feeders right uh, so shubham jyoti naik asks uh, though mullerian mimicry tends to be mutually beneficial is it also possible that some mullerian mimics can be parasitic if a weakly defended mimic benefits at the expense of a highly defended species i'm sorry can you tell me the time uh, of this i 628 sorry 628 shubham jyoti nayak yeah yes 
Domly integrity tends to be initially beneficial. It is also possible that some uh, basically, well, we're talking, uh, if I remember, if I understand right, uh, you're talking about within a group of uh, malarian mimics, one, uh, say, one species um, gains more advantage than the other. If that is the question, then definitely yes, uh, that is bound to happen, I think, because not uh, like in the case of uh, Syntomony, the tribe uh, of moths that we were talking about, Amata doesn't feed on uh, toxic plants. And just because the other uh, species do feed on toxic plants, it could very well be a case of malarian mimicry as well. And in that case, Amata is gaining a lot more advantage than the others because, uh, you know, it's just passing off as one of those toxic feeders and uh, staying safe without uh, developing the ability to feed on these toxic plants. So if you are looking at uh, that sort of uh, disparity in advantage, then definitely that disparity does exist. Uh, does it answer your question? I'm not sure. Anyway, we will move ahead. Uh, I think a lot of questions on similar lines. Pratik also goes on to ask, sir, is mimicry and camouflage dependent on environmental clues, cues? Uh, if due to some cause and an organism is unable to sense those cues, will the organism still exhibit mimicry and camouflage? It is, it is mostly uh, more than the environment. It is already inherent because like we said, when the denied egg fly lays an egg, the eggs will obviously develop into a female which looks like a plain tiger. And it doesn't develop into something which looks like the male denied egg fly and suddenly they change color. That doesn't happen. So it is inherent in a way, what I feel. Anubhav, you, you feel like adding something? Um, sorry, I just uh, lost the trail there. Uh, this is Pr Pratik, is it? 633. Uh, so the thing is, uh, if I get your question right, it is basically saying that does a stick insect wait for certain environmental cues to act like a stick? No, I don't think so. So it has, again, these are traits that uh, it has evolved through a lot of uh, long processes of evolution. And uh, it is going to look like a stick insect. Uh, it is going to look like a stick or a leaf or a twig, no matter the external pressures. So I'm sure these uh, traits have, uh, you know, developed by genetic mutation because of certain environmental pressures. Yes, but uh, but as a as an incidental sort of a case to case, I'm not sure uh, it works like that. about recent locust attacks they change their color and morphology and become aggressive is it related to camouflage i really don't think so because if they were no. if they wanted to blend in so badly they they won't be in swarms or, yeah exactly so uh, exactly. although uh, it's interesting because um, i mean you know it's something that i haven't uh, really read up too much about but nevertheless in uh, locusts also as uh, many of you all might know are a kind of grasshopper and uh, grasshoppers are not exactly known to be social they are uh, largely uh, solitary creatures so right. even the locusts do exist normally as solitary creatures till a certain environmental trigger uh, makes them come together as a swarm so uh, it's uh, something that has uh, that i've not really uh, dug much into and uh, will be really interesting to and i'm not even sure if uh, much has been figured out about the reason why this uh, trigger happens and why they uh, why the change in like behavior that. happens right 
Sunil Kumar asks at 6.30, saying that, sir, is there any creature which mimics its prey to trap its prey? So I think you've seen that Amisha example oh, yes. uh, so clearly. And it was completely detailed there. Many times it so happens that the predator mimics the prey, also taking uh, 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 refuge from the uh, general predators, which are predators to both of them, and also to seek their uh, food. I hope Anubha would ag agree. Uh, like the Amisha example is a very good example for this. I'm sorry, could you tell me the name again of the uh, Kumar at 30. Is any creature which mimics its prey to trap its prey because normally prey tend to mimic. Uh, yeah, so we saw some cases of what we call aggressive mimicry. Aggressive mimicry yes. is exactly that. Uh, it's uh, just mm, and well, uh, mostly creatures don't get aggressive uh, if it's not for matters of food or uh, mate or uh, uh, territory. But in this case, uh, in the case of aggressive mimicry, it's uh, mostly in terms of uh, prey and predator sort of a relationship. And definitely uh, predators have evolved to mimic prey. Right. Rajat Sarkar asks, which kind of selection pressure? I'm not sure if that is selection pressure, what he means favors the camouflage and mimicry of animals during the course of evolution. Uh, that is, why do they actually go ahead and uh, follow the traits of uh, camouflage and mimicry in their so uh, character? I guess it will depend on uh, the, uh, again, case to case. So in the case of, let's say, uh, mimicry, which is uh, has evolved to um, uh, as a form of defense, then it's definitely the pressures from predators that has uh, made it uh, evolve that particular trait. If it is right. uh, aggressive mimicry, it is uh, more opportunity for food. So these are basically, uh, this is basically what um, natural selection is all about, where the uh, these uh, mutations in the genes and development of these traits make that particular creature that much more um, able and competitive in the natural environment so she asks i think we can this is this could be the last question for the session anubha uh, at 640 so she asks ma'am uh, camouflage is used just for hindrance from prey i'm not quite sure what she means or does this characteristic have some other connection also i'm still not very clear about used just for hindrance from or does this characteristic so yeah like we uh, discussed uh, that, so yes. these uh, traits develop for different reasons for different uh, creatures uh, so uh, like we saw there was a lizard so well camouflaged on the branch in my first slide uh, we know for a fact that uh, chameleons also uh, show very good uh, you know adaptability to match their surroundings and so on also uh, although that is also considered to be a form of communication than just uh, camouflage. But the point being that various creatures, uh, so some are to protect themselves from prey and uh, some are to prey and uh, uh, some are, uh, you know, to... Uh, to dodge their prey. Yeah, right. so it depends from case to case. Correct. Okay, I think we have answered, I mean, almost uh, all the questions which were there in the chat box. Thank you, Anubhav. Thank you so much uh, for your patience. Thank you very much for having all me, uh, everyone, and Devi. Yeah, uh, on the platform till now, I guess they must be keen upon entomology because not it is not everyone's cup of tea, like I always say. To have uh, uh, something really keen within you, to be to to be driven towards insects which are really so small and so uh, minute to observe that it takes a whole lot of patience and you will never get something because they are very fidgety very fast and uh, uh, very so many things so uh, <laughs> yes if you do have the patience and an eye for observation go ahead and find out these curious creatures around you and more than being creepy they will be really interesting if you can uh, uh, really uh, follow them properly so uh, yes uh, we will be again back next week with more talks on mangroves uh, how can talks about uh, nature be uh, complete without talks and mangroves so uh, i hope all of you will be uh, back again
same time next week on saturday i thank anubhav for his uh, kind consent and uh, extensive lecture very lustrous presentation with all those beautiful creatures there i hope uh, some of the people there in the uh, platform would have turned themselves towards insects by now let us see how many come up with more questions and more queries further thank you so much all of you uh, this is devi priyadarshini signing off we will meet again saturday next week thank you very much thank you very much for a wonderful talk thank you